Well, good late morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is the uh, third and, and final uh, drone-related session of our drone track this morning at, at CS 2020. Thank you again for, for being here. Some of you have been here since the uh, first one at, at 9 o'clock this morning. We appreciate your attention and, and your questions. Um, the format for the, the panel um, here um, will be similar to the previous two. We'll uh, go down the line with brief introductions of each of you, giving you a minute or two to expand upon your introduction. And then uh, we'll get right into to questions for, for each of you uh, up and down the panel. Uh, but we'll reserve the last few minutes of, of this hour for questions from you in the audience. So please have them in mind, and then we'll turn to you uh, toward the end of the session. So for introductions, uh, let me start with uh, Josh Bixler to my left. He's president of Flight Test. Uh, welcome, Josh, to CES. Uh, to, to his left uh, is Abby uh, uh, Spiker Carroll. He's the CEO and co-founder of Dart Drones. Welcome, Abby. Uh, to her left is, is Hannah Geis, who's Government Affairs Representative of the Academy of Model Aeronautics, or AMA. And to your left is Danielle Corbett, who's with the Federal Aviation Administration. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Josh, let me go back to you and, and give sure. you a minute or so to expand upon uh, your background and, and your involvement in drones. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm honored to uh, run a company called Flight Test. And what Flight Test does is we use aviation as a tool um, through video content, through educational, through outreach programs, and also we manufacture products to get people to be able to overcome hurdles and get into this great hobby. A lot of times people picture drones as something that, uh, you know, maybe like a Phantom or something very advanced. We really focus on the ground level, the roots, the foundation, where we teach people how to build, how to fly, the disciplines and physics of flight characteristics themselves, and also components and how they work together. Uh, we do this in our video content, uh, so both young and old can kind of get into the hobby together. Uh, we also use it socially, too. Thank you. Thank you. Abby? Yes, my name is Abby Spiker, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dart Drones, a drone training school, and we also do a lot of consulting. Um, so we have uh, instructors who are all manned aviation pilots in 30 cities across the country hosting classes for individuals, and then we do a lot of um, enterprise training and training for government entities too. So we've trained most of the broadcast news networks, um, over 300 police and fire departments, um, and in general just tons and tons of individuals from all different uh, industries trying to get into drones. Um, yeah, and we're excited to be here. We'll also be talking about the AVSI Trusted Operator Program, which is something that we're part of. Um, I'm Hannah Geis. I work um, at the Academy of Model Aeronautics. It's the largest uh, model aviation organization in the world. Um, we are a membership organization for people who fly um, recreational model aircraft in UAS. Um, I work in the Government Affairs Department, so I deal with um, the regulations and um, advocacy. So, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Hi, I'm Danielle Corbin. I work for the Federal Aviation Administration, and as Jay said in the last panel, um, the UAS Integration Office is the front door for all drone-related uh, regulations and policies. Um, I've been in, in the office for about four years. It started out to be a pretty small office, and it's grown quite a bit over the years. Um, so I've, I've had an opportunity to get my hands on a lot of the initiatives that we work on from a regulatory and policy perspective. And I've just taken on a new role um, of, of what I'm now calling customer service to try to help um, with the relationships between the FAA and our constituency so that we can better work together more efficiently. So that we'll, we'll be taking on a more proactive uh, outreach and customer service role there. Congratulations on your new role. Thanks. Um, I, know I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning, although I was here at the first panel. Doug Johnson with the Consumer Technology Association. So welcome to all of you, and, and let's dig right in. In fact, Daniel, let's start with what we need to know. Let's start with the rules. And in a sense, we're kind of picking up uh, um, with what uh, Jay Merkel said toward the end of the previous session uh, when he was talking about new rules uh, applicable to, to pilots, specifically um, recreational pilots. So uh, please explain to our audience what has changed and what will be different in 2020. Sure. Um, so late in 2018, there was reauthorization language that um, introduced a new exception for recreational flyers. Um, and basically what that means is if you comply with the provisions of the exception, you don't need to comply with any of the other regulatory parts, and you don't need any additional certifications or authorizations from the FAA to do so. Um, a lot of the language in that exception is similar to what we saw before, um, but there are some new notable things, including um, the requirement to get an airspace authorization for controlled airspace, um, which on its face sounds a little bit more burdensome than the proximity requirement that we previously had, um, but now that we've enabled um, LANS, which is our low altitude uh, authorization notification capability to issue those airspace authorizations in near real time, it's actually quite easy to accomplish. 
Um, and the, the other big change was the introduction of a new knowledge and safety test. Um, that test, as I think Jake was talking about in the last panel, the FAA has already developed the content uh, and questions for that test. And we're, we uh, introduced a cohort uh, that's meeting actually next week to get together with our industry partners to figure out how we can best deliver that content to the public. Um, we recognize that, not that the FAA is not necessarily the most popular name on the street in, in drones. And so we see an opportunity to use our industry partners to deliver that content to their members or uh, customers or students if it's a university. Um, so I think, I hope that we see some interesting um, adoptions of that test where maybe AMA provides it on their website, but maybe a manufacturer provides it on their uh, control panel, or maybe a university can provide it to their students. So we're looking at that as a very good opportunity for us to promote education rather than to test compliance. We're not looking at it as this like hard requirement to make sure that you have uh, the knowledge and competency to fly, but looking at it as an opportunity to educate people through our industry partners to expand our reach and to inspire people to want to be part of this community and to remain part of the community and to build that safety culture that we see in Part 107. So it's a written test? Um, in that it, it'll be electronic. It's written in that it's not practical. Yes, there are words and questions. Yes. One of our panelists uh, in the first session, Skip Fredericks, um, had an idea or had a comment about, gee, what if there were some sort of flight test involved? Would that be an added benefit? It would certainly be an additional burden of sorts, but sure. uh, did the FAA actually consider something beyond the, uh, the written? Uh, Not for the recreational flyers. And for one thing, that would exceed the intent and the, the straight language of the statute, which is driving these changes. But um, the recreational flyers is a, a, you know, a slightly less complex operation that we were talking about earlier, about beyond visual line of sight and package deliveries. And, and so we want to enable this industry to sustain itself and to be able to grow and to encourage people to be able to get involved in it. I think that a practical test for a recreational flyer would be maybe a chilling effect. Understood. Um, Josh, you certainly have a handle on the excitement related to this technology, the excitement we see in Sphere, we've certainly heard about in, in the previous two sessions as well. How would you describe the community uh, that you work with and um, what are they interested in? Uh, what is their approach to piloting? Yeah, a great question. Um, you know, we're blessed, I think, with the best community of aviation enthusiasts because it starts young and old. Uh, these aren't people that just love aviation, but they love using it as a tool. Um, I want you guys to picture, you know, a parent and their child in the basement sharing a memory together, learning about flight, but then going out in their backyard and flying for the first time and having those joys and those challenges overcome together. I also want you guys to picture people that are, you know, in school and don't really like math, don't really like reading, don't really like uh, connecting the curriculum they have to learn with something that fascinates them. You know, aviation-based STEM is so powerful because you actually are connecting them with a project where they learn to do research. And from that research, they come up with an idea. From that idea, they come up with something they want to test. And whether it fails or succeeds, um, they go back to the research. It teaches them how to attack practical problems in a beautiful way. And we currently have over 3,000 students actively doing that right now, using flight as a tool to do something positive. Um, and then you go to the senior level, where people have a, a social opportunity to share wisdom and experiences with each other and to encourage each other to laugh together. Um, I look at flight as a pool, as an amazing tool to do something positive in people's lives, also connecting them with careers. Um, I always say make your passion your profession. If you can learn at a young age that I absolutely love flight, and then you can connect the dots to eventually enable them to, to make a career out of it, I think you're doing a real service, not only for that child or that young person at the time, but also eventually when they become career pilots in the general, general aviation world. By the way, when you're talking students, uh, are we talking grade school or? Uh, We're talking K through 12. K through 12. The beautiful thing is everyone understands what gravity is, and you can fascinate a young child and teach them that you know there's principles of flight out there that you can understand and, and you can overcome, even at the age of five years old. And by the time they get to, to 12th grade, they're not only designing, they're not only flying, but they're networking, they're researching, they're communicating their ideas and their findings, and they're pulling other people's findings and, and bring it together. And by that time, they're actually not only building and designing aircraft that they can fly recreational, but they're taking today's technology and they're bringing those into those platforms. Um, we start very simple. Uh, we have a plane that we love called the Tiny Trainer. And the Tiny Trainer is a little bit over 250 grams, but it's about 11 pieces of what you go to the craft store and find out a phone board. But that little tiny airplane teaches them everything they need to know about the physics and principles of flight. 
And from that point, it's a stepping stone that takes them on the next step and the next step. And we have thousands of these plants being built, not only in schools, but in homes and in backyards. And it just kind of ignites a fire, saying, oh my gosh, I can take something with my bare hands and I can you know, overcome the laws of gravity. Great, great, great. Well, Hannah, uh, your organization, AMA, likewise, um, uh, also has a great handle on the excitement related to drones. But you have a long history, too, going back uh, many decades. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, AMA's approach uh, to model aircraft, uh, model aircraft flying, piloting, and uh, particularly then back to rules, uh, how have you dealt with this new regulatory structure? Yeah, so um, there has been a lot of change um, in the last few years, especially with the increase of drones. Um, AMA has been around for about eight decades, and so it's not the first time that we've seen change. Um, our members have been able, they're innovators, so they've been able to adapt um, and to evolve with the change. Um, I know that there's, every day there's going to be something new, um, but they've been able to adapt to it. Um, I think it's really important to, I know like Josh, he, he has a company just like AMA to kind of tag team there and take these new regulations with an open mind. Um, we want to move the hobby forward, so we're really working on trying to bring new light to it. And I think the new technology that has been available, um, we've been able to bring new light to our STEM initiatives as well. So um, yeah, it's been good. Thank you. And, um, and turning next to um, Abby, um, the rules for commercial operators uh, of drones have been in place for a, a while now. Um, what have been the developments, I guess, beyond the rules, particularly with the program, the trusted operator program of AEVSI that you mentioned? Can you tell us more about that program and maybe why it was created? Sure, yeah, so um, as a group, a lot of people came together with AUVSI, which is um, one of the largest um, unmanned like associations, and they host a huge conference every year, and they have a lot of um, great advocacy programs for unmanned pilots. And they came together and brought experts together who said that one of the, the next things that we need to do in order to progress the industry is to set a set of standards that are based more on flight assessments. Um, so the FAA is not gonna hold us to our flight assessment, but I mean, we've had so many people call us and say, oh, I just got my part 107. Do you know how I turn on my drone? And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of that going on. Um, so this was to try and help move the industry along and set a standard. So um, the Trusted Operator Program, top for short, is um, a like different levels and certifications that you could get to show your expertise. So top level two, there is a flight assessment piece, which is actually really pretty difficult to pass and show that you know what you're doing in terms of um, actually flying, but also making sure you know where you're allowed to be flying and taking off and having your pre-flight set up, um, responding to an emergency. So there's all these sort of like uh, things that you're tested on in order to get this assessment. So the main two goals of the Trusted Operator Program, one was um, to be able to, if a large enterprise like, wanted to hire a thousand pilots in a week or they needed to grow and have this like huge project, right now it's like pretty much like a Facebook group that people will be like, I need to hire a thousand pilots and everyone's just like, well, I'm great at this and you have no idea if they have know what they're doing or not. Um, so that was a big goal for TOP is to be able to identify people who like have taken the steps to prove that they have the certification. And then um, another big goal too is for internal um, programs to be able, a lot of like companies were trying to create their own flight assessments and it, it actually takes a lot of work and a lot of like thought to put this whole flight assessment together. Um, so they were trying to create their own and they were having these like different certifications that didn't mean anything outside of their company. Um, so we've seen a lot of enterprise, of our enterprise like clients and contacts adopting top and then um, having their pilots have like a certification that's known outside of their company. So the goal is, I think, for TOP to be um, a, just a normal industry certification that's accepted um, as a drone. Is it fair to say, though, it was driven by the enterprise, by the business community, by those who needed pilots, but needed to know, like you said, their levels of certification or capability, and it was driven by the market? Yeah, it was definitely driven by the market. We had over 200 experts. Um, like literally talking about it for a year and it finally started like coming together and then launched um, about a year or two ago. Um, so it's slowly rolling out, but as the industry grows and as more companies get stuck needing a thousand pilots, um, it's just like you can't, 
account on a Facebook group and everyone being like, oh, I took this picture, hire yeah. me. Uh, so you need something to be able to do that. Well, uh, turning that to Danielle um, in the FAA, what is the FAA's view of going, I guess, above and beyond the rules in a sense, but creating certification programs and that sort of thing? Is there any, uh, is it analogous to maybe what's happened uh, in manned aviation, or is it just welcome in general by the FAA? Can you absolutely, of... it's absolutely welcome. I mean, any increase in competence is always a good thing. Um, and you know, with, with what Abby said and what DGI was talking about in the last panel about the public safety certification, um, maybe the word certifications, but you know what I mean. Um, it's better for the industry to do that and to create a, a, a standard or best practice than for us to try to figure out all the different types of operations and certifications. There's just so many. Um, so we would certainly welcome anyone who's willing to increase their competency and that just increases safety for everyone. Um, we see that with the public safety side or the public aircraft operators have a self-certification process. Anything that could help them build their programs or help um, have them train to meet their specific mission, absolutely, and I think that best comes from the industry. Does FAA at any level review these, these certification not, programs? Not per se, um, but we do, for an example, um, it could be an element that would help in your waiver request that you have additional training or you have a certification. So we do take it into consideration in, in those kinds of ways, um, but we don't necessarily, um, we certainly don't prescribe what those or uh, standards should be. Sure, sure, okay. Um, Josh, turning back to you, um, well, my seven, my uh, seventh grader um, has watched your channel with enthusiasm and has several questions I will ask you after the session. Yeah. But for the session, um, the enthusiasts who, who watch uh, your YouTube channel, which I think has a million and a half yeah, one point five subscribers, yes. um, could very well be those drone pilots of the future yes. uh, as they progress through school and, and, le and learn skills. Um, how do you use that YouTube platform in general? Because um, yeah. it's 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 a tool of sorts, I suppose, but it's not your only engagement. That's beautiful. It, it absolutely is a tool. Um, we use Flight and YouTube, obviously, to, uh, to get content out. We oftentimes say entertain, educate, and inspire. Uh, we want to, you know, basically give something that families can come together and watch. We want to show an activity they want to repeat, and then we want to inspire them to make that activity their own. So what we do is, through our content, you know, we, we give nuggets of safety. We give nuggets of knowledge. Um, you know, we're gonna one day we're gonna make a toilet fly. The next day we're gonna make a battleship fly, or this, a tank, or something, or a tank. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and we, we take on these crazy projects to basically kind of push the limits of what flight can do. But then we share with people how we overcome those limits uh, through our content. And the learning is, I mean, why this did it fly, or why exactly? It's we show our failures. Uh, the one thing that you know, I think we're all kind of accustomed to is try to hide the failures, try to hide the the hangups and the issues. And that's one of the worst things you can do because, especially in flight, the failures almost uh, accelerate the learning even more because you can observe what went on and then you can say, okay, I learned X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna go ahead and try this now. And we make sure in all of our video content that we share that uh, as much as a tool for flight, but also a life lesson to, to show that, you know, learning and, and, and gradually taking what you've brought back and then trying it again is a very positive thing. It's a thing that will benefit you in life and also in aviation. It's kind of a neat thing, oftentimes people picture pushing the limits uh, with, with safety, uh, getting pushed to the side, and that's absolutely not the case. You can show in a very fun way um, how the limits of life and also the limits of what you can and can't do can be explored. And, and we really feel strongly that whether we're in a school, whether we're telling people how to fly in their backyard, um, how to give best practices. Uh, oftentimes we call ourselves friend on the field. If you went to the field and you wanted to learn how to get into this hobby, you know, who would be that person you would be? And what would they share with you? And we oftentimes try to think of what that conversation would look like and we weave that into our content. So you're absolutely right when you say that, that our YouTube channel is a tool. Um, we also make all of our content family friendly and we think that's very important because now that educational content, that funny content can be brought right into schools and it can be absorbed in, in uh, workshops, you know, summer camps, uh, in many different atmospheres where uh, it's not just good for a laugh and then gone tomorrow, but it's actually a resource people can look back on. And it seems like your show, at least in the videos that I've seen, or that my son has shown me, um, that you're, you've got not only operations in the field, but you're showing what's happening in the workshop before you get outside yeah. and try to fly. Right? Yeah, we always, we always, everything that we build is built out of simple, common, everyday materials. Uh, from day one, we thought flight test needs to be something that helps people overcome boundaries. And at the time, the boundaries was not understanding the technology, and, and frankly, the hobby was too expensive. You know, let's, let's go spend four months, build a $400 airplane, take it out in our backyard, and promptly break it into a thousand pieces. 
nobody wants that memory. I mean, that, that's a very difficult thing. So we realized very quickly, if they can learn how to build it, they know how to fix it. If we can identify materials they can get to any day they want from a craft store or a, uh, um, uh, a local hobby shop even, um, that makes it far more accessible. So we use you know, things we call foam board, barbecue sticks, popsicle sticks, but we never compromise on the experience of flight. By the time these people are done building this, they've learned how to, you know, how an airfoil works, how center of gravity is important, how thrust and, and angle of attack and stuff all work together. Uh, this is really important because this is what gives disciplines early on. So as they grow and say new electronics come along and new technologies come along or career paths come along, they already are familiar with the technology on a component level. Just not here is the finished product, let's go ahead and use it as a tool. Uh, which nothing's wrong with that, but we want them to have a deeper knowledge. And so when we go into our schools, and, and we started about five years ago, our STEM program, and we currently have over 3,000 students all over the country and 700 teachers actively teaching. And that's not even counting our homeschoolers or our summer camps. It's such a thrill to know that people can take that in there and they can, they can teach that and how it's going to change their lives. Mm -hmm. well, one of our panelists on, on the first panel actually was referring to the, the fact that he's taught students from grade school age uh, to retirement, um, uh, how to fly drones for different purposes. And Hannah, this has been going on for a long time uh, with AMA and out in fields uh, with the modeling community. Can you talk a little bit more about um, your structure and your approach to that? And then I'm going to ask you a bit more about community-based organizations on the policy side. But but first, you know, what's the experience for somebody wanting to learn? joining a club mm -hmm. and then your organization. Yeah, so we have clubs all over um, the nation. Um, so being an AMA member, we have flying sites um, also across and so people can form clubs and start these clubs and um, a lot of times they teach each other how to fly. Um, that's how they hang out with each other um, or they'll bring, if they have sons or children that they want to bring into the hobby um, to start them to fly. That's how they'll go ahead and do it. Um, we've had, like I said, we've been around for eight decades. So a lot of times we've had our members who are lifelong. They started when they were five, and they've been a member until they're 80 or 90 or however. And so um, they have, a lot of times they work for airlines, or they have this aviation background, or something in them has sparked that they want to be a part of this community. And so they look to AMA to kind of teach them um, how to go about it and how to fly safely too. I mean, that is one of the biggest things, especially now with all the regulations going on. Um, but we will provide our um, members with that education and the tools needed to do so. And apparently insurance too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we offer insurance. So um, it covers, I think it's $1.5 million up to insurance for um, their drones or UAS model aircraft, however you want to say it, but yeah. Well, I want to talk about community-based organizations, but maybe, Danielle, I could turn to you just to explain to the audience what that term has meant and what it will mean going forward. And I was just saying, it's, it's a group of people who kind of get together and formulate their, their safety guidelines for the type of operations that they're doing. So, like we were talking about the new statute earlier, uh, the exception for recreational operators. I've said it so many times that you would think I would have, it doesn't roll off the tongue. It's the exception for limited recreational operation of unmanned aircraft. It actually defines what a community-based organization is, and it has to be a- For the first time, it's defined, right? It for the first time, it's, it's, it's more defined than it had been before, but uh, in, in concept, it's, uh, it's a group that's kind of self-defining what it does and, and formulating guidelines that work for them. Uh, but another new element of this uh, statute is that the FA now must recognize community-based organizations, which we haven't done before. Now, we have a relationship with AMA, and we recognize that, you know, that they have their, their guidelines and they abide by them. Um, so that's just, a, in, in, in some aspect, it's a new burden on everyone to kind of go through this process. But in, in another way, it's an opportunity for more players to get in the game and to define what the safety guidelines are for their type of operation. So if it's a you know, quadcopter community versus you know, your model aircraft community. So, uh, and, and, it, and they're able to kind of define, you know, like I said, the, the exception only has eight provisions. The community-based guidelines kind of helps drive the, the safety culture for that group of uh, people. So Abby, I want to turn to you in a moment um, you know, with respect to, um, to your advice, but uh, before we leave the talk of, topic of community-based organizations, I wanted to get more feedback from, from Hannah and from Josh on, on how they see that rule from their perspective. Uh, are you ready for it? This is definition fifth. Um, and I guess it's the first because we departed from you a moment ago. 
Um, yeah, so AMA has been a community-based organization um, for a while now, but like Danielle said, they haven't been able to recognize, um, they haven't done CBO recognition. Um, so that is something that we're looking forward to, is getting that official recognition. Um, obviously, there are other organizations out there that want that same recognition, um, but being able to be a CBO, we've been able to do, um, be a player in the regulations. and. Um, especially like with the safety and knowledge test, we were on the board for that, so we helped develop the questions that Danielle also said they're, they're ready to go. Um, we're just going to see how it's going to be rolled out here um, in the next few weeks. So we've been able to play a key role in that. Um, we're also, um, we've been able to provide um, our members with that safety culture. So um, we have a safety programming, we have um, education, um, and when those other organizations want to become CEOs, um, I think it's really important to make sure that those organizations are able to provide their community with the same um, the same knowledge and um, safety materials that AMA has been providing their members for the last eight decades because it, it's been working. So now we all just need to work together to kind of evolve it um, with all this new technology and everything. Thank you. And Josh, what is, what, what is your view on community-based organizations yeah. and what is needed to support and encourage them going forward? Yeah, well, it, the great thing about model aviation is um, there's all, so many different facets of it. You could have a soaring community, you could have race drones or race quads, you could have you know, people with fly gas, you could have um, park flyers in the backyard. It all is very different. And the beautiful thing, I guess, about the CBOs is they can really focus on the demographic that they need to serve and really outline the safety guidelines and the and the programs to, to really meet the needs. And, and the better they can meet the needs, um, I think the, the more successful it will be. Uh, Flight Test has something called the FTCA. Uh, right here in the U.S., we have 1.53 million worldwide. But right here in the U.S., we have 800,000 active users um, that we engage with, that we give content to, that engage back with us. Uh, we feel it's really important to make sure they're, they're heard, they're represented, but also looking at the age demographic, looking at the activities that they enjoy, the types of planes they fly. Uh, we really want to make sure that we custom outline safety guidelines that they can adapt to. Um, compliance is so important here. If we can't explain something to them that they can accept or they can put into practice, it, it builds more walls than bridges. And um, so I'm excited that we're officially uh, at least have met the requirements of becoming a CBO. But also, I really hope that there's a lot more CBOs that will be developed as well, too, um, because I, I'm not going to be arrogant to admit that only uh, Hannah and I are the only ones that represent an amazing group of aviation enthusiasts. Um, and as time goes on, I think that's going to help the FAA be better informed. And also, as new regulations, hopefully not many new ones, come along, we'll be able to put it into practice in a way that people can comply with, but also digest and buy into. Well, as your organizations foster that enthusiasm, um, you may want to start a business. And Abby, that's exactly what you did. You're an entrepreneur and drone operator. So can you talk to us about, I guess, your how you got into it and, um, and your advice to those who, with that enthusiasm, with that knowledge, and with this, and the, the, the certification and the test and everything, then they want to do something with that drone. They may want to make money. They want to start a business. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so a lot of the people that we work with, we call them drone entrepreneurs. Um, so they're either start by saying that they want to have a career in drones um, and get hired by a company, or they want to start their own um, like drone services business. And what we recommend is really, um, obviously like starting now, the, the industry has like progressed a little bit um, where there are a lot of these drone service providers out there. But um, we definitely recommend starting sooner than later and then slowly progressing into becoming really advanced in a specific area. Um, so a lot of people like always, real estate comes to mind or um, like wedding photography, like a lot of people sort of start there and we try to open their minds and have them start thinking more and more about more advanced um, inspections, industrial inspections. There's some drone entrepreneurs making a lot of money doing like um, oil refinery inspections, um, inspections for mining companies. So as you get more and more and more advanced with what you're offering, you could charge a lot more and there's way less competition. Um, so that's what we've started working towards is creating more advanced classes that um, once someone like has the basics and they've offered their like real estate photography a little bit, then they want to become like an expert at, at um, whether it be like inspections or mapping and modeling. Um, so that's what we definitely recommend is the way to progress and to really like specialize. 
that way. And then um, a lot of our customers and clients have like found that um, once you find a really great like sort of gig, like where you're offering your drone services, um, usually as long as you're doing the job well, they won't switch away from you. So um, at the beginning, people were always trying to like collect as many clients as they could. And now a lot of our successful alumni have really found like five to 10 clients who want them to come back every month and do like consistent work for them, whether it's like a building that's going up and they're going back and creating, um, collecting data like week after week on the building or um, like just something new, some sort of new construction. Um, so that's what we recommend and, and a lot of people are very, very happy with um, their like switch into the drone career. And for the people who want to start their career in drones, um, we definitely like try to steer them towards becoming a drone service provider so you can sort of start small and slowly progress and uh, become more of an expert. Um, there will be companies that are hiring drone pilots and will be hiring more and more like full-time drone pilots. Our assumption is that they would probably want to hire someone who's done like X amount of hours and X amount of flights. Like I don't think they're going to be like, oh, like you've never flown a drone, we'll train you for the next two years. Um, so that's what we recommend someone start with is just getting out there and slowly doing more um, advanced and complicated flights. Is it the case that most um, uh, commercial drone pilots uh, are essentially small businesses out on their own, or are they? Uh, is there a, is, a, is there an organization analogous to, to to flight test or AMA where they brought them together in a sort of, sort of organization or community, and uh, we provide pilots, for example? Uh, so is it is it an individual course, or is it are there companies of drone pilots that are out there serving industry sectors and that sort of? Thing? I think um, there's all three of the above. So there's they all exist. yeah, definitely individuals who are just getting started and don't have enough clients on their own. Then there's definitely um, like people who started as individuals and they have a ton of work and they can't do it all themselves, so they've hired three to ten. Um, operators to do the work with them um, and a lot of our instructors have actually run into that too like they they're also drone operators and they uh, drone service providers and they like will sort of um, actually start hiring some of our alumni the people in their classes to then go do the work for them um, and then there's a we've seen a big change in who's in our classes so um, three years ago, four years ago, it was a lot of recreational people, and then it started being a lot of service providers, and there was a huge like wave of service providers, and now we're seeing it's a lot more like large enterprise clients, a lot of like government agencies that they're sending people um, to, to go and like figure out drone programs. So that's definitely growing from what we've seen, and the service providers are sort of staying steady with um, who's in the classes for us. So there's been that evolution on your side, on the commercial side, um, professional side. Um, what about the evolution on the recreational hobbyist uh, consumer side? I mean, uh, for example, um, Hannah, has, has your user base uh, changed? Are there different people showing up at these club meetings? Uh, you know, what's been the trend in terms of those wanting to learn how to fly and, and or flying recreationally within? organization? Yeah, so um, a lot of our members, a lot, they mostly fly traditional model aircraft, um, but with the introduction of drones, a lot of them um, want to know more about drones. They want to know how to fly them. Um, so there will be one or two people in that club that know how to do so, and so um, they'll ask them if they can teach them how um, we do that at our clubs. Um, that is something we want to do, is we want someone to know exactly um, how to use these these drones or UAS um, to show others and teach others the right way to do so. So a lot of youth still coming into the mm -hmm. Oh, program. yeah. Um, a lot of youth, um, like I said, a lot of our members um, are older and they've been doing this for a long time. So um, there are younger people and we have um, partnerships with like JROTC and whatnot um, and um, that want to learn and use these for other purposes. Thank you. And what are some interesting trends that have happened with flight tests since you've been at the helm of, of, of that organization? Well, the beautiful thing to your question is, is the answer is yes. Uh, we started out making content for the whole family, so we were engaging simultaneously, young and old alike, you know, parents and children. But also, the, the reason we got started was because there were so many mysteries into getting into the hobby. So we were really taking on, right from the beginning, you know, what is an electric motor, what is a battery, how do you properly charge it, how do you install that, what is it? Demystifying it. Demystifying, exactly. But also as FPV came along, 
you know, we, we showed how those components work together, how to put them on. So one thing Flight Test celebrates is as new innovations come along, we're really quick to want to be able to bring that into people's worlds and to communicate it properly. And um, because we've been known about that, you know, it's obviously been very successful. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about is every year we have an event called Flight Fest. And at that event, we have these built tents, and people can come in as a family, young and old alike, and they can walk and they can pick out a project, and there's volunteers ready to help them build it, help them assemble it. And the second it's done, they're out on the flight line, and there's another volunteer ready to help them get that maiden flight and then to actively teach them. In the course of that four days, we've been able to get about four or five different generations you know, from young or old, and, and aunts, uncles, you know, brothers, cousins, um, they come back and they do it as a family activity, but the best part is then they go home with that and they continue on that journey. Um, so it's it's a really rewarding experience to see that. But I love the fact that Flight Test not only hits every demographic, but it also hits every level of technology. Well, I was about to ask uh, that uh, about outreach to um or disadvantaged communities, ones that don't yeah. get exposure as much to STEM. Yeah. It sounds like some of that is happening already. Yeah, yeah. Um, a matter of fact, in, in Detroit, we had a program with uh, indoor drones, where you know a lot of kids, unfortunately, in small inner cities, they don't have a space to fly outside, but they do have a gymnasium. And we worked with uh, with the program there to basically bring a drone in and to introduce these kids to something that would spark uh, an interest, because a lot of it was based around um, you know I need to be a rock star in sports, or I need to do this, or else they don't know whether any other chapters. But what we found really quickly was it was like a universal language of fascination where we could bring that in. And, and once you got you know these children working together, their hunger for understanding how these motors work, how these control boards work, suddenly now you didn't have to tell them they needed to read and how important it was. They knew it was important because they wanted to find that out. Um, we actually had right by my house um, during an outreach. We uh, we went to a school and. There were these two young men, uh, fifth grade, that were just constantly bucking heads. We put a plane in between them, and they built a plane together. And I have a picture of them, and they're not looking at each other bucking heads. They were flying together and laughing together. And it was just really cool how, again, going back, it's a tool. It's an amazing tool around an amazing activity. That's great. It's a great story. And Danielle, is this all happening uh, as FAA had hoped and expected as, it's, as it continues to assemble the, the policy framework around drones? Is FAA pleased with what it sees happening in terms of additional professionalism uh, on the commercial side, you know, expansion of, of clubs and opportunities to, to learn about drones, uh, learn and appreciate the safety culture? I mean, is this, I assume this is good news to the FAA. Absolutely. I think the safety culture within the Part 107 or the more professional side of, um, is, is formed and forming and, and mimicking or, you know, what we have in the manned aircraft world, not, not, not in style, but in concept. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the growth of this industry is, is great, and we're happy to see it. We love aviation, that's why we're here. Um, but it is, it's happening quickly, and so largely it's hard for us to keep up with um, touch, touching all the people that need to be touched. So I got a, that, that was a weird thing to say, but um, I got a drone for Christmas this year. I opened it up, I was very excited. I got a Mavic Mini, and I love it. Um, but I got that experience of, you know, I'm a pilot, I flew professionally, I work with the UAS Integration Office, I know a lot about drones, and I just wanted to get out of the box and go fly it. Um, and you so, register your drone already. <laughs> I did not need to be registered. <laughs> um, so, um, I think that was a, a, an, ex, an example of a, you know, a person who, you know, could be in those shoes that we need to be able to get information to. And to have that information be somewhat obvious, but also the non-obvious information to get it to them in a way that they can consume it. And so um, what we are pleased with is that the industry is still embracing with us and that we are hopefully becoming a respected part of that community and will continue to do so and that we can pump out information for industry partners. So I think building that safety culture at a larger scale with the recreational flyers is still, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in that area, um, but we're looking forward to doing it. By the way, uh, since we're at an international uh, trade show, um, we've been, well, some of your organizations are obviously domestically focused, I assume, uh, or maybe AMA is in Canada too, I think. Um, we actually have a partnership with Canada. We okay. work with them, um, we help them develop um, their regulations and um, their organization that is similar to AMA. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to ask, in fact, if anybody in the panel wants to respond, but I, Danielle, I was going to start uh, back with you about uh, the sharing of these experiences or learnings or best practices, particularly in the recreational and hobbyist side, but also the commercial side with respect to pilots. Our FAA continues to liaise with other regulators around the world in these things. Are we on the vanguard of, of 
what we are talking about here and, and sharing that globally? Or what, what's your perspective on the international side? On the international side? Um, well, certainly we're trying to you know, be the, the leader in, in what Jay was talking about earlier is that it makes sense to have um, a regulatory framework that is, you know, broad in scope so that I can go up to Canada and fly my drone. I come down here and fly my drone. And, you know, um, the regulations and the requirements are, are the same or similar. So um, we do reach out with, you know, we're definitely on the, you know, on the higher end of complex operations working globally. Um, on the lower end, I mean, we're, we're certainly um, working closely with Canada. We get a lot of information from them on how they've addressed the recreational flyers and that helped us inform our tests. So things like that. Um, but the way we reach out just kind of more broadly, and we just had our drone safety week. Um, that was a national um, event, but it got international attention and hopefully it was kind of set the standard for us to be able to um, ex extend our reach. We were able to get all 50 states to participate in this, um, to get a broad variety of our, you know, a lot of our partners work on the international stage too. So and I keep saying the same messages that we're working through our international or our industry partners, but that's how we, that's how we reach out to the, to the flyer community. And Abby, certainly people around the world could be doing the same thing and are doing the same thing um, you have done in starting a company. And maybe there are also certification programs out there that they're working on too. But do you have an international perspective on this, or a network, or what can you say? Yeah, we've done some pretty cool international training, um, which is surprising. So it seems like maybe they, I don't know if they don't have um, like a set up drone training school in their country or not. But um, we've done some like really cool ones, especially with like governments of other um, international governments. Um, but TOP is actually uh, an international program too. Um, so like right now, the three training providers in TOP are all um, approved in the US, but the goal for TOP is for it to be an international certification. Um, so there's like a process that if we wanted to get approved in like Australia or something, we would have to go through it to get become approved. But that is the goal of, of oh, TOP, okay. um, is to be accepted internationally. Great. And Josh, certainly um, anybody can tune into your YouTube channel, for example, around the world. Do you have any sense of uh, the international following of, of your uh, community, at least online? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned earlier um, we, we do get to hit a worldwide audience, and uh, you also mentioned earlier different demographics in, in different countries and different stages, to be frank with you. And one thing that's really excited, uh, exciting to us is because we use common materials, because we teach people uh, the basics of flight. Uh, we see people in countries that could never in a hundred years explore model aviation or advanced technology, remote controlled, um, literally saying, I don't have foam board, I have cardboard. And guess what? It works the same. And they build it and they get fascinated and they share their pictures and their experiences. And then some of them even turn it into careers because it is so rare you know, for someone to have that knowledge. It turns their families around, it turns their lives around where Again, it goes from a passion to a profession. So it's likely you're, you're fostering interest yeah. around the world. Yeah, we, we do something kind of unique. Everything that we design and we manufacture as a speed build kit, we also give away free plans for. And that's very strategic and on purpose because we don't want there to be, and again, any barriers, whether it's economic means, whether it's time means, um, for people to be able to enjoy this great hobby and get started in, a, in, a, in flight. So any, anything we design, every month we put out a new plan. So every month there's a new ex either a new memory that can be had, a new experience someone can have, a new thing that someone will really learn. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the audience uh, for the promised uh, opportunity to ask questions in, in just a moment. Um, but Danielle, let me just return to the um, to the event uh, or campaign that you mentioned. Um, first ever National Drone Safety Awareness Week took mm -hmm. place um, in November, early November. I think certainly before the, the holiday shopping season. Um, FAA had never done anything like this before. You did it in partnership with, with uh, parties in the public and private sector across the United States. Um, you going to do it again? What came out of this? What have you learned? Yeah, absolutely. We hope that for this to be an annual event. Um, we consider it a success. Uh, the first year we had uh, participation in all 50 states. We had over 125 events that we know of that participated. Um, and we look at this kind of taking a page from the like the Air Force safety stand down model, where you, you take a break for a minute from uh, the operations and, and the stress over waivers and, and all the fun stress that comes with all that, just to focus on the safety part and just to say, hey, let's just sit down and and, and talk about all the safety elements, not just the flight, but there's also you know other elements, of ground safety and all this, um, as well as being able to engage the communities. We talked a lot about that in the last panel where community engagement is a necessary element for this industry to continue to grow and be accepted. Um, so we were able to encourage, um, there was 
public safety agencies, law enforcement schools, AMA, AUVSI, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second, um, who did events like free training, who did events like uh, demonstration flights, and got people out there who might be interested in getting involved in the community to be able to understand what's uh, required of them or what it looks like, and got other community members who may not want to be drone flyers, but just to understand what it is and what it means, so that when you hear the little buzzing, you don't have to put up, you know, your, your close your blinds and call the police. Um, so we consider it a very big success, and we look forward to doing it again next year. Okay. Was there a particular focus on, on younger, uh, the younger uh, uh, operators? Not per se, but that's certainly an important element of this, is STEM programs and young children. Um, and there was a lot of uh, engagement in those fields. Um, did you, and, and uh, AMA, is, as you mentioned, was, was part of this too. Do, do any of you have uh, thoughts or comments on such an uh, annual campaign and, and uh, good thing? Did you participate? Uh, would you like to see it happen again? I think it was really successful. Um, I know that AMA, um, some of our clubs used it as a tool to um, educate their local law enforcement law enforcement um, and have them out on site and um, use training purposes for that week. Um, and we also had our expo, we have our national expo um, out in Pomona, California, and that we used that kind of to kick off the week. So it, it was really successful for us. Yeah, it encouraged us to participate. We partnered with, I think, like five or six um, other like drone companies to offer um, our, we have a class on like Lance and AirMap, how to use AirMap that's online. Um, so we offered that for free, and then um, our partners also promoted it. So I think it's great to encourage like people to give away free content, free training, um, just to educate people because there's so many people who don't realize like that. Just like um, Danielle had said, that you just don't know that you need to be educated on things. You're just flying under an airport, and you're like, oh, whatever. Um, so that's really important, I think, just to get the word out there, and I think it definitely accomplished that. We, we were a fan of it. And you, and of course, FAA was trying to cover all facets of, of the drone industry. It wasn't just recreational, obviously, it was commercial yeah. and the safety case across the board. Yeah, every day highlighted something different, which was really cool. So, yeah, I think the education was just Saturday or something, right? The younger group was just on the weekend, and, and then it was each day a few theme. enterprise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Josh, any thoughts on the uh, yeah. such a campaign week? Yeah, we, we had a great time during the campaign week. Um, we're fortunate we have a location called Edgewater Air Park, and every Thursday and Friday we have different themes. Um, that Thursday and Friday we did the same thing we always do. We actually had uh, people come out that never had been exposed to the hobby, uh, and they come out and we have a whole line of airplanes, and we teach them for free. And this isn't just adults, this is kids, young and old alike. And then we tell them, come out the next day, we'll teach you some more, but bring the whole family. And then what oftentimes we do is we have a family-centric activity, whether it's a bonfire, a movie under the stars, live music. And what we noticed really quickly was when we started this early on, when we, we opened the doors of Edgewater, you would have one or two people come in the beginning of the year. And then those people would bring their friends back. And now, every Thursday and Friday night, we have tons of people coming out bringing new friends that have never been uh, exposed to the hobby, but then also kind of like fellowshipping and gathering around for the family-centric activity. Uh, generally, just trying to communicate the benefits of model aviation to the general public, you can have um, you know, structured campaigns that go out there, and those are very effective. Um, or you can bring them through a friend, and through an activity that they can adapt to, and then let them observe it um, through a very beautiful filter. And what we found was we have boys and girls, young and old alike, that started at the very beginning when we started this program. And January 1st, they were building their downstairs build area and still flying in freezing cold weather because they didn't want to, uh, to didn't want to wait, they want to kick off the year right. So I think programs for any CBO, for anything, um, yes, having it focused on a week is really important, but weaving into the culture of day-to-day -day life uh, is just as important, and in my opinion, more important. Thank you, Josh. Uh, like the title of this session uh, suggests, Delphi, you got a sense of the opportunities related to, to piloting and, uh, and even a sense of how to get started if you're interested. Um, but now let me turn to, your, to any questions from the audience here. We don't have a microphone, so please stand up and introduce yourself and speak loud so we can hear you up here. Uh, I see a hand here. Yes? Yeah, Spencer Top. Um, so I've got a Mavic Pro and um, probably been flying two or three years. But question, um, I was messing around with drone deploy, um, that, that, that app can map, um, you can get, uh, I guess, topographical measurements and stuff like that. What are other cool apps that, you know, if you're an avid flyer that you would recommend 
Sure, yeah. Drone Deploy is really cool. Um, and really what Drone Deploy did is pulled from Pix4D and made Pix4D more approachable. Um, but I would, if you're into mapping modeling, Pix4D would be an amazing thing to start to learn. So Drone Deploy tried to like simplify Pix4D um, and make it so that someone could just out of the box try, try and work with it. Um, but once you get more and more advanced, um, that could be something like, that if you became really skilled at that, you could be charging a lot of money for like someone to have like really, really in-depth maps and models. What was that? Pix4D, P-I-X-4-D. P -I -X -4 -D. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Another question. Um, I came a little late, so maybe I already said this, but if you could just give me a summarized version of when you start off with a new drone, uh, what process you get the drone, uh, should get licensed, uh, and then just whatever that step that process looks like. So oh, Daniel, you want to tackle that first? He just got a new drone. <laughs> I, I just got mine. It's all right. Plug and play. No. Um, so depending on what you get, I mean, if it's if you're just flying for recreational purposes, and so if you're Say that again? I have a video production company, so we for professional commercial. Okay, so if you want to fly for a company, then you would have to get what we call a part, uh, remote pilot certificate. And you would operate under the regulatory part known as Part 107, which is basically our regulatory framework for that type of operation. We, could, we call it the commercial rule, but it's not technically. But if you want to operate commercially, you have to operate under this part. So if you go to the federal aviation regulations and look under Part 107, it will spell it out. But essentially what you need to do is register your drone. You could do that you know, on our website for five bucks. And it's a low burden there. Um, and then you would have to take a written test at a testing location um, to get this pilot certificate. Um, and on our website, we have a study guide that will help you uh, pass that test. It covers things like airspace, uh, pre-flight planning, and all that kind of stuff. Um, from there, um, you're, you've met kind of your, your first two hurdles. Um, but you might want to call Abby. <laughs> And you know, like she was saying, I mean, you can go out and teach yourself how to fly, and, and you know, the, the equipment is certainly uh, very capable. So depending on the type of flying that you're doing, you might want to seek a little bit of additional training to figure out how to best use your equipment um, for your business. Um, but if you look, if you read through the regulation, you'll see that there are some provisions that you know. For an example, you have to fly during the day. So if you want to fly at night, take night photography, you would have to apply for a waiver. Uh, and that's a process that you can do through our website, um, which, like all things government, is not necessarily really quick, uh, a, a really quick process. Um, it can be slow, you know, it, it can be quick depending on how much information you give us and if you give us your safety case, um, or it can, you know, take months or weeks. So, uh, and then the, the other thing I would recommend that you do um, sooner than later is um, look at our Before You Fly app or one of our USS lands providers uh, applications to help you familiarize yourself with the airspace that you plan on operating in and understand what the uh, requirements are for those airspaces. So if you're in a controlled airspace, which is generally uh, within a five mile or so proximity of an airport, you would need an airspace authorization and those come with altitude limitations. And we have published grids on what you can get you know, quickly. So for example, if you're, if you're within a couple of miles of the runway um, in one area, you may be able to get 50 feet in another 400 feet. Um, so that could really inform the type of, of operation you want to do or the type of additional authorization you need to seek. And again, you'd have to do that through our website, and that's not an instantaneous process. So there is a little bit of kind of forethought before you can get up and flying for your business, but um, hopefully the barriers aren't too high. Um, but, you know, like, like Abby was saying, I think that there's, there's so many um, opportunities to, to really go beyond what the regulations require to be a proficient and competent pilot. Thank you for your question and congratulations on your purchase as well. Yeah. Abby, did you have a comment as well? Yeah. Follow yeah, I think um, that covered what you should do. I mean, personally, I, I like to do things the right way. So that's like a lot of people that are in our classes want someone to like show them how to do things. Unless, like if you're someone that figures it out yourself, then um, you could definitely teach yourself to fly. Um, so a lot of people like to do our basic flight training class where we need to show you everything about the drone and how to fly, take it out of the box. Um, and then for part 107, the remote pilot certificate, you definitely could um, like pass the test by, there's like a bunch of YouTube shows and stuff, um, but we have um, an online and in-person class that teaches you the in-person in one day, like everything that you would need to do, and then online it's about eight hours. Um, so, and then there's lots of other companies too that have uh, test prep classes. Um, so yeah, that's like a really good place to start and where most of our um, students start. Um, and then they start 
if they're interested in top, the trusted operator program, then a lot of times they'll do like their top one certificate, um, which is more online classes and teaches you just about like all these different sort of scenarios that you can run into and quizzes you on that kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, definitely if you wanted to just look at YouTube, you could like start to piece some stuff together or you could do something more like of an organized training. Uh, I've got one, but uh, here's one more question. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's a lot of speculation on the future of drone services uh, going all autonomous, and I was wondering what your views are on how that will affect the typical Part 107 pilot looking for. Yeah, I think um, back to that, what I was talking about with the career, like there will still be uh, like a career in drones, like they'll still be pilots, but they might not be what a pilot is today. They'll still be someone in charge of like these drones. It's not like they're all just going to be flying and like no one has any idea where they are. Um, so there still will be some really high tech jobs like managing these drone fleets. Um, so this is like a great place to get started. Um, but then a lot of the stuff that we're doing, like anything photography and videography, that probably won't be as autonomous because yeah. that's more of the art. We'll see the enterprise side thing probably going to go more autonomous, do you agree? Yeah, I would say so. So us as a company, we're starting to prepare for that and starting to, um, we're doing a lot more consulting and a lot more uh, like getting companies set up for autonomy. Um, and it will go that way. So it's a question of what will happen with the service providers. I know a lot of like the insurance companies right now, they are all working towards someone just pressing a button up, like and just standing there and they're the remote pilot and the drone does the whole, job autonomously, um, which of course would be great for any business, but the, the um, drone operator still has to stand there um, and know what to do in an emergency. But um, as our, our chief curriculum developer, she um, was the one that built the curriculum for the Navy's like $5 million drone, and that's totally autonomous, but um, they are trained, like she says, an insane amount because you're not training for the 99% of the time that things go perfectly. You're training for the 1% that it doesn't go right. Um, because if you've never flown it before and it's autonomously flying around, you have no idea. And then it doesn't go right, like there's no chance of you trying to save it. Um, so that's that's what our position is. It will be interesting for service providers. I think they'll have to adapt too. And I do think there will still be opportunities. Um, honestly, I think it will be even harder for someone just getting started to like even understand those opportunities versus someone who's been doing it for a while can like slowly shift over there. Thank you. Well, we have time for one final question and some final thoughts down the road here. Let me ask this, um, we're at the beginning of the new year. Uh, what one professional development or re regulatory development would you like to see uh, happen before the end of this year? We'll start with you, Josh. All right. Um, that's a really great question. Uh, you've heard me kind of go back and back over and over again about how flight test is about overcoming hurdles. Um, one thing, uh, and this is, I guess, where the optimism starts or stops, I can see a very simple way to bring compliance uh, to the newest regulations under 349. Uh, many of them are very easy to understand. Um, you know, uh, CBOs, I can, I can understand that. Uh, Knowledge-based tests, I, I buy into that. It's really important for people to understand how to properly operate a uh, drone safely or a recreational model aircraft. Um, for a 100 foot altitude, I can understand the spirit behind it. But one thing that really concerns me, um, and that would be a very big roadblock to being able to go into those schools, being able to engage those families, just start in aviation, is clarity on remote ID. Uh, it's really important uh, in 2020, in my opinion, that we develop a system that gives many different paths to remote ID so they're not um, burdensome, whether it's the cost of putting equipment on your plane, the cost of a service, um, the technology that you have to, to purchase, um, or just even communicate in a way that people can buy in and implement it. Uh, we need to make sure that it is something that is shared and people understand the spirit behind it and also how they can do it and that the technology that comes doesn't build a barrier. Because my concern is, is if remote ID goes the wrong direction, we're not gonna have 3,000 students in the USA taking an aviation and becoming passionate. That's gonna turn into possibly thousands of people that aren't gonna be looking to Abbey to become professional pilots, or people that are gonna grow to use our airspace and become career pilots in the general aviation world. Uh, you're not gonna have the social benefits of flight in, uh, in the home 
where you know parents are connected with their children and, and, and encouraging each other. Um, this is the one thing out of all the regulation of 349 that really, frankly, rattles me the most um, because I can't communicate it. I can't give a good definitive answer on how it's going to be complied, and I can't, I can't encourage people that's not going to impact them in a negative way. Thank you. Thank you. Abby. Yeah, um, I don't, it might be dreaming big that it might be this year, but we're really excited about um, whenever Beyond Visual Line of Sight uh, rules come out and are more um, openly sort of growing um, the industry in that way. I know you could get a waiver now, and it's something that a lot of companies are like sort of starting to work on, but um, that's definitely a big barrier that we've seen with our like enterprise clients is that they, um, but they sort of are like, oh, maybe we'll just wait for Beyond Visual Line of Sight. So we're excited for that because we think even if they're doing missions that aren't Beyond Visual Line of Sight, it would still open up the market more for us. Yeah. Um, so for AMA, something that we're really looking forward to is that CPO recognition. Um, so that's something that we're excited for and hopefully we can get um, moving forward in 2020. Um, but going off of what Josh said about remote ID, um, I think it's really important to take into account um, that we need to figure out a way for recreational purposes that everybody can comply in an easy way um, to make it simple for them. So. Thank you. And Danielle, so, all the rules we're going to get. Yeah, remote ID is a topic of, of the hour and the week and, and our time. It, it's certainly a really important rule. And um, I know that there was a lot of anticipation for it and uh, maybe some consternation now. So I, my hope for 2020 would be that, um, that we field some really good um, substantive quality comments. Um, that the, the FA is able to um, consider those and implement uh, a rule that makes sense for everyone. Um, and it would be nice to have that rule finalized in 2020, but as we were talking, uh, I think it's more important to get it right. Um, but wouldn't it be great to get it right and quickly? So uh, I know it's, it's, a, it's a big hope, but um, I think Remote ID is the founding uh, principle on ETM and getting us to routine beyond visual on the site so, and ops over people and all these other things. So we really got to. Um, figure out remote ID in a way that's going to work for everybody. It's been a great panel, it's been a great audience. Thank you very much. Please join me in applause for